Hello, Mountain. Good to see everybody. Glad you're here. My name is Ben. We're starting a new series right now called Love Handles, right? Love Handles are those little extra something, something right here. A little more to grab hold of and love on a little bit, right? That little muffin top, that little, that little spillage, that little extra bulge. I have, I have love handles. Yes, I do. I have love handles. How, how about you? A lot of people have love handles. We try to hide them. We try to, we try to um, cover them, whatever. Uh, we try to get rid of them, try to work out and, and get rid of them. But, you know, a lot of us, we just live with love handles. And the reason is you, you look at, we, we always are looking at these pictures of these beautifully sculpted, airbrushed figures in the magazines and the pictures and the posters and the movies and all that. And then you look at that and you go, that, that is what I'm supposed to look like. Then you look in the mirror and you go, ha ha, that is not what I look like, right? There's a big difference usually. And, and love handles really are, are just one more reminder that we're imperfect people. That's really what they are. Um, we have all kinds of flaws, not just in our physique, right? but also in, in, in who we are, in our temperament, in our personality, in um, our character, in our relationship with God. We're, we're imperfect people. And guess what? So is everybody else, which is what makes relationships such a hoot because everyone's kind of messed up a little bit. I'm imperfect, you're imperfect, and, and it makes relationships more challenging that way. So that's why we're beginning this series, just saying, how can we best get a handle on relationships and on life um, when we're dealing with my own imperfections and someone else's, and yet we're called to love each other? How does that really work in life? So that's what we're going to do over the next several weeks, is try to get a godly grip, whether the relationships that are, are important in your life right now are those with your parents, or maybe with someone you're dating, or, or a spouse, or children, or an ex-spouse, or, or loving your friends, or loving your enemies, whatever the case may be. And today we want to try to encourage uh, and say some things that will challenge mothers and others. Some things for moms, but something for all of us as well. And I know that whenever we get to Mother's Day and, and talk about stuff that has to do with moms, I know it's a day that a lot of us come to with a lot of mixed emotions. Um, and it's, just, it's a day we try to be as sensitive as we know how to be, honestly, because it's a day that's a hard day for a lot of people. Um, all of the happiness and the sort of making out over moms and, and um, you know, the hallmark uh, sentimentality around it sometimes just actually makes it harder for some others because it's, it awkwardly reminds of pain that, um, you know, of a mom you never had like that. Um, or... Um, maybe it's a reminder of a mother who's no longer with you. Um, or, you know, some have moms that were hard to love or moms who didn't love. Or some moms have families who don't support them very much. And some just want to be a mom, but it's not happening. And there's a lot of reasons, these and others, why today can be kind of a hard day. And we don't want to make it any harder, but we do want to, we do want to observe the fifth of the Ten Commandments and honor moms uh, today, um, and you know, the, the moms I'm most mindful of today uh, are the moms in my world, so I got a picture to show you here, I got, there's my mom on the, on the left there with my dad, she's 87, lives in Minnesota, and then my own uh, wife, the mother of my children, Carla, and then Carla's mom over there acting silly with the grandkids, something on her head, I don't even know what that is, but they're all godly women, I'm so grateful for them, you know, they have love handles too, they're imperfect people, but I love them a lot and I'm grateful for them. Will you just join me in conveying a message to moms everywhere, um, the perfect ones and the rest of them. Uh, let's show our love, respect, and honor and gratitude one more time, but just give them a warm round of applause. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Deserve a lot more than applause. Um, a family was telling how they have this, they had this 10-year-old cat named Jack. And they really liked this cat. And the kids, it was one of these cats, the kids would kind of carry him around like a bag of beans, you know, and they'd sit on him. Nothing ever bothered this cat. And uh, the cat used to hang out and nap all day long on this little mat they had in the bathroom. Well, they had three kids at the time. And the kids were four years old, three years old, and one year old. The middle one, three year old, was Eli. And Eli loved chapstick. Loved chapstick. Just fascinated. Loved, loved, loved chapstick. And he was always borrowing and grabbing the chapstick, and then he would lose it, and they wouldn't be able to find it. So his mom finally said, okay, Eli, you can use the chapstick anytime you want to. Showed him where it was kept in a drawer in the bathroom. As long as you use it, put it back. 
put it back. And so he kind of got that. Well, the next Mother's Day, which was, uh, you know, I think a year ago now, they were racing around just like every other Mother's Day, trying to get ready to get in the car and go to church and, you know, getting the baby loaded in the car. Two of them are fighting over the toy and the cereal and, you know, she's throwing on makeup at the last second. They're all mad and sad and crying and in the car finally buckled up and they can't find Eli. Where's Eli? So she gets back out, run back up the stairs, can't find him, look, finally finds Eli in the bathroom. And there he was, applying chapstick very carefully to Jack the Cat's rear end. <laughs> and she looked at him, and Eli looked up at his mom and just said, he was chapped. <laughs> now, if you have a cat, actually, you look at their butt and... I can understand. They do look kind of chapped sometimes. And frankly, she said the cat didn't seem to mind. <laughs> kind of seemed to enjoy it, appreciate it a little bit. And of course, the only question I have is, was that the first time? <laughs> or the hundredth time that Eli had done that to the cat's behind? All I know is it couldn't have happened to a nicer animal. Um, that's kind of a little snapshot of what it's like for a mom very often. You know, the, the craziness and the constant struggle. And, and the truth is, a lot of times... Um, the stories don't just end with cute little laugh lines. Sometimes they're a lot more difficult. Sometimes life is just exhausting and disappointing and difficult. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about something today that, that I really know nothing about, and that's motherhood. But I'm going to get some help from the Bible, and uh, there's some great words there for us today, for some mothers and some others, okay, for all of us, to help us get a handle and make life work. I'm going to introduce you to a, a mother named Rebecca from the book of Genesis, and I think you'll find her story kind of encouraging because Rebecca is a pretty good mom, but she's not perfect. She's got love handles just like every other mom. And it gives us a pretty realistic picture of life. The Bible always does that. It gives us a pretty realistic picture of life and how to keep God in the part of it. And her life, has it starts with kind of a high note, but it gets to some hardship pretty quickly. It starts on a honeymoon and it gets, it gets to some heartache. And it begins with... Um, with Abraham. Uh, if you remember Abraham, he's the father of the Jewish nation, right? And he's got a son named Isaac who's 40 years old, still living in the basement, and he says, it's time for you to get a wife, get out of the house. He's got to solve this problem and find a good woman for his son Isaac. Now, if you remember, Isaac was a baby who came very late in life. Abraham and Sarah didn't have any children. God had promised them that they would carry the seed of the family line and they didn't have any kids. And so when Isaac comes along late in life, they're just overwhelmed and, and they, so they love Isaac uh, so, so much that it's understandable that they really want to get the perfect woman for him. He's very, very special. So the woman has to be very special. She has to have, uh, you know, a lot in common, has to have the family heritage, has to um, share faith. My grandpa used to say when I was a high schooler, started getting around girls, he'd say, hey, make sure she can come to church with you. If you can't take a girl to church, you shouldn't take her anywhere. That's what he used to say. Not bad advice. That seems to be kind of what's on Abraham's mind. He looks around. He says, there's no good girls around here. And so he does something very strange. He gets one of his servants. He says, I need you to go far away and find... How do you think the local girls felt? It's like, we need, I need a really good wife for my, do- for my son. And uh, we're leaving town to find her. And uh, he sends this guy off to find... Like a headhunter for a spouse. Okay? Go get my son a wife. How'd you like that responsibility of finding an awesome, beautiful, perfect spouse for your boss's kid. I don't know if I'd like that. And there was no match.com or Christian Mingle to help. So he's got a tough job. Talk about pressure. So he loads up 10 camels and, and uh, supplies and the whole caravan. They leave Canaan and they head over to Abraham's homeland searching for the one. Now he has a sign that he envisions is going to be a, a message from heaven, a divine appointment, a sign from God when he's going to know it's the one for Isaac. Uh, he says, God... I'm going to watch uh, all the young women who come out to the well at a certain town here when they get water. And if any one of them offers water to my camels, I'm going to take that as a sign from you that she's the woman for Isaac. (laughs) Which sounds to me like kind of a weird, desperate way to find a wife. But um, you find things like that in the Bible all the time. It'd be like a guy today saying, you know what? I'm going to go to the Walmart produce section and hang out by the kumquats and the first girl who comes along and picks up two of them and looks at them, I'm going to say, that's the one for me. It's like, whatever. Okay, but it's in the Bible. So there it is. I've seen guys that desperate. Sure enough, sure enough, Abraham's servant goes, he prays that prayer and within seconds, along comes this Beyonce-ish, Rana-ish, Kira Knightley-ish babe named Rebecca to get water at the well. 
Now, this is a good time for a pickup line, right? You know, there are some good and bad pickup lines. You guys know there's some really bad pickup You know some good pickup lines? You want to hear some good pickup lines? Guys, some of you need some help. Okay, so it's like, excuse me, are you a parking ticket? Because you've got fine written all over you. That's not a bad, that's not bad. <laughs> that's not bad. Yeah, that's pretty good. Are you religious? Because you just answered my prayers. That's pretty good. Oh, I seem to have lost my phone number. Can I have yours? That's, those are good lines right there. You've got to use that stuff, right? Are you a boxer? Because you just knocked me out. Okay, you're not laughing as much anymore. You want another one? I'll give you another one. Uh, I don't have my library card with me, but do you mind if I check you out? That's pretty good. Here's my favorite one. My favorite one is, uh, are you an appendix? Because I've got a funny feeling in my stomach and I feel like I should take you out. So whatever, those are good pickup lines. But this guy, in the Bible, apparently in the Bible, in the first century, you can't use good pickup lines. And when you're also trying to get a girl, not for yourself, but for your dad's son, you don't use it. Here's what he says. He says, can I have a drink of water from that jar on your shoulder? Best he could do, apparently. Anyway, she lowers the jar, gives him a drink, and then on cue, just like on cue, she says in verse 24, uh, chapter 24 of Genesis, verse 19, I'll draw, waters, I'll draw water for your camels, too. Until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more, and drew enough for all his camels. And this guy's thinking, bam, right there, Eureka, I found her. And the more he learns about her, the more he likes her. She seems personable. She seems like she's got a good moral center. She's a virgin. She's got character. She's pleasant, personable, obviously has a great work ethic. And best of all, she seems available and willing to relocate. So he wants to um, close the deal. Verse 58 this is a weird way of arranging marriages in that culture, but it's what happened. So they, her whole family, uh, uh, called Rebecca and they asked, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Just like that. She figures it's, she's confident that it's God's will. And so she goes, uh, somehow amazingly, she packed up in a day, and uh, I don't know how that happened, but uh, she packed up and she heads off to this place. She's going to make new friends, and she's going to meet this man she had never even met. She's not the first woman, and probably even in this room, who would later say, you know, on, when we got married, I'm not sure I even knew him. The Bible describes this then movie-like scene. Uh, where Rebecca and Isaac get their first glimpse of each other. And, of course, it's out on a field, and they start the music score, and here's Prince Charming meditating on the field. He looks up, and there's the music, you know, uh, you know slow down, slow motion, and uh, uh, sort of chariots of fire type of music. And there she comes, his princess, on a camel between the humps, sitting side saddle with a demure veil over her face, and she comes riding along, and his heart leaps out of his skin. He feels like a guy looking down the aisle when the doors open, dun, 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 dun. And, and, and that's how he feels. And then she comes up, and she looks down, and she sees Isaac. <gasps> the breath goes away <gasps> and she says is that my stud muffin? <laughs> that's my loose paraphrase that's the BLT translation the Ben's loose translation anyway it's this romantic description in the Bible filled with sparks and exciting electric energy and the employee is going Shh, looks like it could be a match I'm off the hook and the Bible says in chapter 24 verse 67 Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother Sarah and he married Rebekah she became his wife and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. And they lived happily ever after. Isn't that a beautiful story? That's amazing. I've got to tell you something to be honest with you here. <clears throat> I added the part about they lived happily ever after. That's not actually in the Bible. So just forget that part. Because actually that didn't happen. You know, we think it's going to happen, don't we? It's what they thought was going to happen. And we have all these stories of, of idealism where we meet and fall in love at first sight. But the words happily ever after really don't usually happen that way when we get married, when we become part of a new family, when we become an in-law, when we move to a new place, or we become a father or mother. The happily ever after is what we expect, and then here's what happens. Then we start finding love handles all over the place. And our unrealistic expectations that have motored us so far run smack dab into the wall of reality. Reality constructed by the blocks of the imperfections in our own lives and the lives of everybody else. And the truth is, for Isaac and Rebecca, is the truth for a lot of people, their marriage and their family, their parenting was plagued with all kinds of pressure and problem and pain. 
Because we've got all these idealisms and this, this idea of people riding off into the sunset. Let me tell you how it is. If you, some of you young people here, you need to, let me just shoot straight with you, okay? Some of you are going to get married someday. Let me just tell you how it's going to be. This is how it works, right? You know, you're going you're to find the perfect person who really doesn't have hardly any, any uh, love handles at all. And you're going to get married and it'll be a perfect day and it's going to be cheap. Your wedding's going to be cheap. And everything's going to go perfectly. The weather's going to be nice and nothing bad is going to happen in the wedding and everyone will show up and no one will get drunk and embarrass you. And then you're going to have a romantic honeymoon that's going to be a beautiful three weeks or four maybe in an exotic paradise. You're going to come home with so much money left over you buy a new house with a white picket fence and then you're going to buy a minivan and soon you're going to fill it with your perfectly behaved amazing little 2.3 children. At the end of an average day these well-behaved fun-filled little gems of people are going to come up and they can pick up their toys by themselves and the precious darling is going to come and thank you mom and dad just give you a big hug and a night kiss and then brush their teeth on their own go straight to bed read himself the story tuck himself in with a smile on their face and you and mom and dad are just going to sit there for a while and drink a cup of tea by the glow of the fireplace while you're snuggling and laughing and giggling because that's just Tuesday because every day is a vacation when you have a family that's how it's going to go it's a honeymoon all the time. And that's how it is, isn't it? With young people, they get so infatuated. They set their affection. Oh, so like, oh there she is. I'm on the camel between the humps. Oh. Oh, did you just see how he was out there in the field? Oh. Isaac, I will go with that man. And they don't know. <laughs> they can't see. Grab someone's love handles and say, they don't know. Isn't that right? They, don't, they can't see the job pressure. They can't see the bills piling up. They can't smell dirty diapers. They don't know there's going to be little demons running around their house one day. They don't know the toxicity of morning breath or what laundry is like or rent due, kids fighting in the backseat of the car or the emotional damage from mistrust and disappointment that comes. When your life turns out to be a far cry from the honeymoon, and in fact, you just get hit with the hardship and the high point turns in to just heartache. You know, for, for Rebecca and Isaac, one of the hardships for them was infertility. They had dreams of a family. It says in verse 21, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. It was a burden for them to bear. And you know, it's a burden for a lot of couples today. It's a struggle. It can be heartbreaking. I want to say a word here, especially to those families and because I know Mother's Day is hard for you especially, especially if you've tried desperately to have children, but like Rebecca and Isaac, you don't have any. I, I have people who are very dear to me, related very close to me, who have helped me to feel the stinging emotions that go with a couple who wants to have children, who have prayed desperately to have children, who have tried everything to have children, who have paid enormous sums to have children, who have endured uncomfortable medical procedures to have children, but still who have no children. We want you to know we're aware of some of the pain and disappointment that you might have. We want you to know that um, we care about you. And it's good for all of us to remember that that kind of experience can be a tremendous test to your faith, can be a tremendous strain on the marriage, can feel like tremendous pressure in your family and a lot of things like that. For 20 years... Uh, that's what Isaac and Rebecca experienced. Tried, prayed, cried out to God. I appreciate the fact they never abandoned their faith in God. They never lost their trust or hope in the Lord through it all. And for those of you who are walking in those shoes right now, I want to encourage you to do the same, to hold on to the Lord, to realize that God is at work even in this difficult, frustrating part of your life, even though He may not be answering your prayers the way you wish He would. And remind you that He won't waste any of it. And He's using it, even now, in ways you might not see, but He's shaping you and preparing you for something. And to remind you that if there's a hole in your heart uh, left by where you wish a child would be, that the One who is meant to fill that place is the Lord Himself. To invite you to, to reach out to Him even more. For some of you, you might be called to adopt. And for some, you might be led to sort of throw yourself into children's ministry and just love on other people's kids. Or you might be called to be one of those heroes who foster children who might otherwise fall through the cracks. Or you might open up another avenue of ministry that you couldn't do if you had had children. 
You never know. Sometimes, as you did with Rebecca and Isaac, eventually he gives you a child. Whatever the case, I just encourage you to trust God as your ultimate hope. Whenever we put our hope ultimately on family, I must be married, I must have that boyfriend. I must have children because that's what it's going to take, I know, to make me feel okay finally. We're only going to find ourselves with unanswered prayers and disappointment. There's only one relationship that will ultimately fill us and that's the Lord. So another sort of pain that this family felt was constant conflict, divisiveness and tension in their family. As soon as I say that, a lot of you may be thinking, well, that's my family too. The Bible tells us a very kind of grim picture of this family. If you look at verse 21 of Genesis 25, the Lord answered Isaac's prayer and his wife Rebecca became pregnant. Sounds like really amazing news, but from the time, the babies, first of all, that's interesting, plural, The babies jostled each other within her. That doesn't sound comfortable. And she said, why is this happening to me? And so she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and the older will serve the younger. And so we begin to see this uh, picture. Any any twins or triplets in the room? Anybody? Go ahead and raise your hand if you are. Show of hands. There you are. Yeah. See, that was a bad idea for your parents to do that because... Because, you know, there's this chaos when any baby comes into a home. Having two or three is even worse. I don't know how they did it. My mom's a twin. And uh, sometimes you love, love, love your, your twins or your triplets really close. You have a special bond. Sometimes not so much. And uh, that's what happened here in this case. They're wrestling in the womb and the wrestling never stops. It never stops. And to make matters worse in this family, the parents play favorites. There's favoritism. We have to love each kid uniquely, but when you sort of place your affection on one to the exclusion of another in any kind of step or whatever family situation, it always wreaks ca- havoc and hurts hearts and messes with the family. Genesis 25:28. The father, Isaac, he liked wild game. He had a taste for it, so he loved Esau. But Rebecca, the mother, she loved Jacob. These are the twins, Isaac and Rebecca have Jacob and Esau now. Jacob and Esau, these brothers wrestling in the twins. So Esau is the older brother. He's a Duck Dynasty type. He likes hunting, shops at Bass Pro, and loves trucks and country music. And Jacob wears skinny jeans and Tommy Hilfiger, and he is sensitive, and he's a mama's boy. And so Rebecca places her affection on Jacob to the exclusion of Esau, and it wreaks havoc in this. Now add to the mix. Now Esau is the older one, which means he's entitled in that culture to the blessing from the father. He's entitled to a double portion of the inheritance. He will lead the family. He will receive the blessing, and he'll carry the seed that God said would be important. And that really ticked off younger brother Jacob. Ticked him off. And so what happens is Jacob and his mother conspire together and work up this plot to steal the family blessing and birthright by dressing up an animal fur so that the daddy thinks that the old blind blind dad thinks he's Esau and they trick him out of giving the blessing and he does. He gets the blessing. He becomes the head of the family. Jacob, by snookery, becomes this one who will receive the double inheritance. Everyone fell for it and Rebecca is in on this, deceiving her own husband and playing favorites with her own son against her other son because she didn't trust God when he said, I'm going to take care of this and the older will serve the younger she took it into her own hands and it messed up this family in a big bad way and you can about imagine how older brother Esau felt about his conniving little slippery brother who cheated him out of the birthright Genesis 27 verse 41 it says from that time on Esau hated Jacob because their father had given Jacob the blessing so Esau began to scheme he waits he says as soon as my dad dies I'm going to kill my brother that becomes his number one mission in life And you talk about a relational disaster and a family in trouble, dysfunction and stress. It's a heartbroken mother, a mistrusting father. It messes with all the siblings. It's just a a hardship. And it divides that family. And so Rebecca figures it out. She says, she says, Jacob, your brother Esau is going to kill you. You better get out of here. Go over to my uncle Laban. He'll take care of you. And so little baby, little baby Jacob, mama's boy, goes running off to her brother Laban. And you know what? He's there 15 years, and Jacob and Esau never speak. No text messages, no phone calls on their birthday. And Rebecca never never saw Jacob again. And she died with a hole in her heart, as probably every mother does to some degree. 
And through it all, though, through all of her mistakes, she never lost faith that God was at work in her own imperfect life and in the life of her family. And I respect that about Rebecca. Now, let me just pull out a couple of important takeaways for all of us, for some mothers, but for others, okay? Let's pull out some lessons we can learn from this uh, great story in the, in the Bible. Let me just give you a, a few of them today, okay? Here's one. The thing that we should really want most for our children, if you love a child, the thing you want most for them is whatever God wants for that child. Think of all the things that we want for our kids. Go ahead, just think of the things you really want for a kid you love, a, grand, a grandchild or your own kid. Think of all the things you want for them. The point I'm making here is that of all the things you want for them, and there's a lot of things, I'm sure, the thing that we should really want above all things is not what we want for them or not what they want. The thing we should want more than anything is whatever God would want for them. Wanting God's will for your kids is the highest goal and the greatest hope a parent can ever have. What, what does God want? Of course, this is what Rebecca really ultimately did want. God told her when she, she just knew that God had a plan for her kid's life. Even though she kind of went about it the wrong way, it's true. And it's true of all of us. God has a plan. He has some desires and dreams for your kids as well. And for a Christ follower, where there's no higher reward for a parent who follows Jesus than to see their kids sincerely become followers of Jesus too in their own way, in their own right. To want what God wants for their own life. And the way you do that is by living your own life for God. A godly mother and parent feels, along with the words of 3 John, 3 John 1, 4, which says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. That is a huge, huge thing. We want whatever God wants. I have a word for you. Okay, so I'm going to give a word just to parents now. Or if you're a guardian or someone taking care of raising up a young child, here's what I want you to know. You have the primary responsibility for spiritual leadership in that child's life. It's given to you by God. Not to a church. Not to Mount, it's not the responsibility of Mount Kidmore, Mount 54, or Mountain Christian School, or, or some you know, Fellowship of Christian Athletes or some Awana Club down the street. It's given to you. An old uh, proverb says, an ounce of mother is worth a pound of clergy. It's true. And the church is going to come alongside. We're going to partner. We're going to be strategic partners to help you and, and to create a community where you can plug your child in and get so much help and benefit. But the primary responsibility comes to you. Think of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 and 7, which says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. You got to re- just the best thing you can do for your kid is love God. In all your imperfections, love God. And, and then put these commandments that I give you, put them on your hearts. Don't just follow some rules in your home, but let your heart love God and let your kids see that. And then it says, and then impress all of this on your children. Stamp it into them so it makes an impression on them. If you love God with your, and, and you put it on your own heart, you'll impress it on your children. And talk about God. Talk about them. Talk about when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. This is, a, this is a scripture about faith at home. Faith in the everydayness of life. Faith as you're clearing the table. Faith as you're, as you're driving to a soccer match. Faith as you're working on a school project. You bring it intentionally into your life. Now, there's some simple things we found in our family. Simple things that make the difference in terms of bringing God into the center of our home. You've got to be on purpose about this. So let's think of a few examples real practical for a little bit. Some of us, some of you are going to take vacations this summer. You're going to have a few days to stay home or a few days to maybe go to the beach or whatever. Maybe you're going to get a couple of days. I hope you do. And if you've got kids, can I just encourage you to be intentional about the vacation and ask how are you going to bring God into that vacation? Use it as you walk along the way, as you drive in the car. Read Psalm 19 together as you look at the stars one night. As you look out at the water, read Psalm 8. Put in a Christian song where you're in the radio and say, let's all listen to this song. Let's just turn on our phones for a minute. Let's just listen to this song for a minute. Find some way. You know, I do a lot of funerals. And invariably, as children stand up to talk about their parents and what they remember, it's vacations that come back to mind. And those are the things that stick. So how can you make it a place and a time where they not only remember and have a great time, but put God in the center of it? 
Hey, and what about, what about if more of us just made it a point to eat dinner together this summer as a family? If you've still got anyone under your roof, now's the time to make a plan. Eat family together. Driving through McDonald's in the drive through is not what we're talking about here. You know, National Merit Scholars, you know what they have in common? There's a lot of common denominators. It's not what you'd think. They don't really have family income level or academic history. Or it's not that they study a certain number of hours and all that. What National Merit Scholars have in common, the one common trait, is that their families share a meal together almost every day. Isn't that interesting? There's something to it. So, you know, for us, when we share a meal together, that means you turn the TV off, you, you know, the phones don't stay down on the lap, they go somewhere else in a basket, the earbuds and the iPods come off and out, and we join hands. You, whether you're in public, out in a, a restaurant, or around your table, you join hands and you, 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 you thank God. You count your blessings together, and you laugh and you listen and you talk, and it can be a favorite time of your day. You've got to be intentional about it. What if, over the next 90 days, some families in this room decided to to pray together once a day, before bed maybe. What if some families decided to get the Bible apps that sometimes are out there? Our family tried this where you just get, everyone get the same app on you version and you read, read together. And uh, hey, did you read your Bible app today? And a little short devotion, a couple of verses, you can, you can do it together. Maybe there's other things you can think of, but wouldn't it be great if after 90 days this summer we can come back and share that, we, hey, we built some memories, we went on some vacations, we read the Bible, we ate some meals, and we grew together spiritually together because families let out because you loved God and impressed it on your children. What you want for your kid, I'm telling you, is what God wants. And what God wants is to know them in a personal relationship. The second word I want to give just especially to moms today. Because we know how hard it can be to be a mom, whether you've got little ones, toddlers running around, or school-aged children, or high schoolers, heaven forbid, like I do. Or, you know, they're older and out, and sometimes that's still difficult, sometimes it's more difficult. Some of you are sandwich moms, you've got a parent up here and kids down here. Here's what I want you to know, even though when it's hard, you are never alone. You are never alone. There is help. And the help comes from God, and it comes from other people, from God's people. Don't ever forget it. The Bible says, you know, don't become weary in doing good. And sometimes moms just probably want to say, yeah, right. Because I know it's easy to become weary. But there's a tremendous source of help from God and from other people. I've always loved Psalm 121. It's one of my favorite passages. But I, I want you to just give it as a gift to moms today. It's good for all of us, but listen to Psalm 121 from how it can be so helpful for a mom it starts out by saying I look up to the mountains thinking where will my help come from moms you probably had a moment like that you look out the window and you go help right where am I help going to come from and then you say oh my help comes from the Lord the Lord who made heaven and earth the Lord who made these little demons running around my house the Lord the Lord is my help and then verse 3 and 4 says, He's not going to let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. There's days when you just want to take a nap. You need sleep. But then you remember the Lord who watches over Israel. He never slumbers or sleeps. And He's got you. He watches over you. He stands behind you and beside you. Like when you used to cover the sun when you're driving along in the car and you were hiding the, the sun so your baby wouldn't wake up. And the Lord does that. He's your protective shade. Verse 7, The Lord keeps you from all harm and He watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forever. Moms, your help comes from the Lord. Look up. Single moms, special shout out to you. We love you. You're amazing. We don't know how you do it. Single moms, it's the fastest growing population in the world right now. 55% of births in the USA are to a single mom. 56% in this county. 19 million single moms in the U.S., 47 million children being raised by a single mom today. It brings to mind the scripture, 1 Timothy 5, 5, which says, you know, the widow who's really in need and left all alone, she puts her hope in God. Whether you're a single mom or a widow, just continue night and day to ask God for your help. Look to Him. Your help comes from the Lord. And you can't always find those long extended moments with a cup of coffee and a sunrise to get a quiet time with the Lord. Just catch it on the fly when you can. Whisper a prayer and don't wait to be with God in the calm. Meet God in the crazy. Draw strength from God. Draw strength from one another. Galatians 6.2 says, Help each other in troubles and problems. This is the kind of law that Christ asks us to obey. Bear one another's burdens. Come around those. This is, this is good religion, the Lord says in James. 
to look after orphans and widows in their distress. We've got to come around single moms and all moms. You know, Melanie Morena is an amazing mother. She's one of our moms here in this church. She and her husband Gary have a 26-year-old, Matthew, and then they have these triplets that she raised, and they're, they're in their 20s now. And then Amanda's graduating high school. She's here today, uh, graduating high school in a few weeks. And then Ben, lively, lively big old bundle of energy, big hugger Ben. Ben's got Down syndrome, so that some call him special needs, but he's just plain special. So this family with six kids, I'll tell you, they never have a dull moment in their house. Uh, and especially so now, uh, since a few weeks back, Melanie got very sick very fast with cancer. And today she's really just trying to regain her strength to qualify for a clinical trial to help fight that cancer. I visited with her this last week, and life's hard for her. Her body is weak, but her faith is so strong. I said, do you have a message for mom? She says, I do. So here is a message from Melanie. Watch the screen. Hi, I'm um sitting here in Mercy Hospital and I just want to encourage all of you moms who struggle like I have done for years trying to do everything right and trying to make everything happen for your kids and your family in just the right way and <laughs> knowing that you can't do it possibly physically all that you want to do. Um, but what I would like to encourage you to do as a mom, whether you're a single mom or have an entire family wrapped around you is to keep your eyes up, keep looking up to Jesus, keep trusting him mm -hmm. every day because that is where your strength and your resource comes. Mm -hmm. Keep looking to him, lift your eyes up to him, mm -hmm. forgive yourself for the things that you can't get done exactly right. It's okay because when you are following Christ, your kids forgive you for, for what you can't do, and they love you the more for all of your trying. So let those things go that you can't fix or do perfectly and go on to the next thing and just keep trusting, trusting, trusting in the one who is your provider, who is your banner, and who goes before you and holds you in every moment of your life. Thanks. There's help. You lift up your eyes, and the Lord is there. And you find help from God and His people. Let me give you one last, one last uh, word from this story that might be helpful for us today, for mothers and others. And that is to remember that no family is perfect. So be forgiving. No family is perfect. Be forgiving. We all, as it turns out, have love handles. And imperfections. Your family does too. Your mother does. No wife, no mother, no father, no husband, no kid, no daughter. No one's perfect. And so as a reaction to that, you can choose one of two things. You can have the truth of everyone's imperfections drive you crazy, make you a nagger and bitter, angry at the world, frustrated that your expectations aren't met. Or... You can learn the power of forgiveness. It turns out that each of us has love handles. And God has chosen. He's seeing fit to love us anyway. And He wants a relationship with you. And He offers forgiveness for us. Can you imagine that? God, God loves us. And when that happens to you, when you have that kind of grace and you accept His forgiveness in your life, it changes how you live in your family relationships as well. And when that kind of grace happens to you, you can offer it, see, to others. So we all have these two choices. We can continue to pin all of our hopes on this one. The husband, the wife, the kids, the one I'm going to date or meet, the in-law, the whatever. But when we do, we will always be disappointed because we're counting on that person to fulfill a part of our lives that was impossible for any human being to fulfill because there's a part of your life and mine that can only be filled by one relationship and that relationship is with Jesus himself. And so, with humans, we always come into love handles and imperfections and you have two choices. You can just let it make you bitter or you can choose the path of forgiveness and it turns out that's the one God chose with you. 
And that's what gives us the power and the grace to do it for others. Now these brothers in the story, Jacob and Esau, they had a feud for 15 years. No speaking. Brutal. And the Bible tells how Jacob returns home finally in an attempt to reconcile with his brother while they're still both alive. It's a very tense scene, Esau. You know, the last he'd heard was heard from him, he was going to kill his brother. Jacob sends word ahead, I'm coming. Be as it may. And uh, Esau comes out to meet him with 400 men. This doesn't look good. And just when you think the worst is about to happen, Genesis 33, 4 says this, Then Esau ran to meet him and embraced him affectionately and kissed him. And both of them were in tears. And he began to put a family back together again. I think if Rebecca had been alive, it would have been a very happy moment for that mom. Every family needs to have a moment like that one every once in a while. Every relationship needs to have a lot of those moments if it's going to survive. Where you come back together. That, that's the only way to get past the hurt. It's the only way to get past the disappointment and the failures and the way we wound each other because of our imperfections. We hurt each other. We do. We disappoint. We disgust each other. So you can choose one of two paths. You can split apart or you can let the same grace that brought you back to Jesus be the grace that helps pull your family together. You probably have a relationship with someone in your family that you're not as close to as you could be. Maybe it's someone who hurt you or took something from you like Jacob took from Esau. Maybe it was five hours ago. Maybe it was five years or days ago. I don't know. But one of the greatest gifts you could give anyone on Mother's Day, yourself, them, maybe your mom or dad or sister, whoever, is the same gift of forgiveness that that family experienced. Let me give you 12 words to close that are needed for healing and every family, every relationship needs these 12 words. I don't know if they need them all at the same time, but you're going to need some of these words. Really, here are the, here are the 12 words that will give you a key to your family. Here, are you ready? I was wrong. I am sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. Sounds simple, pretty hard though, to say some of those words at the right time, but boy, there's power in those words. Maybe some of those words. Which three need to fall off your lips in the next little while? You know, as I think about Rebecca, some words that keep coming back to me is that question that they asked her. Genesis 24, verse 58. Remember, they asked her these words Will you go with this man? She feels it's from God and she says, I will go. I will go. In a few moments right now, we're going to gather around the communion table as we do every week. So I'm going to ask those who are preparing communion, if you'll go ahead and just take your places right now and get ready to service the communion elements, these elements of Jesus' body and his blood, the cup and the bread. And really, communion is a time for each of us to hear that question that was asked of Rebecca. Will you go with this man? Will you trust your whole life and future to Jesus? I know some of you are still trying to live your life. Be a mother, do a family, get a grip. But you're trying to do it without the power and the grace of Jesus in your life. Jesus loves you with an everlasting love through every failure, every mistake, every love handle. And the Bible says that Jesus is coming back for us, for His bride, the church. So let me ask you, will, will you go with this man? If you want to go with Him then, then you make that choice today. Will you go with this man? So if you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and your Savior and asked Him to forgive your shortcomings and your sin, if you've never yielded your life to Him and said, I will go with this man wherever he leads, if you've never yielded in Christian baptism, why not decide today that you're going to do that? You could do it right at communion today. I will do it. I'll go with this man. Let's pray together. God, You possess within Yourself all of the attributes of the best mother. You comfort and protect and nurture us and you've been faithful and a friend. And you've sent Jesus to love us. And so now, Lord, we say, I will go with this man. May each of us be able to say those words. In the name of Jesus, we pray, I will go with that man.
Amen.